It's the 12th of April, 1993, and I'm standing before a chain link fence. The chain link fence is covered with blood and human flesh. If I close my eyes, it's like I'm still there. And I've dreamt this scene many, many times since it happened. On the other side of the chain link fence are the bodies and a few of the survivors of a terrible shelling where children were playing football. It's the town of Srebrenica in eastern Bosnia. Sixty-five children were killed, ultimately, and more than 100 terribly wounded. Sixty-five doesn't sound like a dramatic number when we hear huge numbers these days. But I can tell you, when you see 65 dead people, children in one place, it seems like the entire world, all the children of the world, piled together. I was the only UN civilian in Srebrenica at that time, working with a very small group of brave peacekeepers in impossible circumstances. The people had fled from surrounding villages. They were living, many even outside, without shelter, desperate for food, staying alive just with airdrops dropped from the sky, some eating leaves, they were so desperate. And even though it was April, it was still quite cold at night, so people were also suffering from cold, and they were getting sick. And they were surrounded by a hostile army, and they were being shelled every day. The best we could do was the next morning organize a convoy of the wounded and some of the survivors to take them to a nearby town across the front line where they could receive better medical attention and maybe save some of their lives. They arrived in a place called Tuzla, where the international media was present and took pictures of the children coming off those trucks because they were transported on trucks, that's all we had. People were so desperate when that convoy was leaving Srebrenica the morning of the 13th of April, they were actually throwing their children onto the trucks to get them out of there. Knowing they may never see them again, but thinking maybe this is the only way I can save my child's life. Fast forward to February 1994. I'm in the town of Banja Luka, a very different context to Srebrenica. It's away from the front line, it's still in Bosnia, but the war does not feel so close, at least in terms of fighting between armed forces or shelling artillery. But something very nasty and evil is happening, because every night people are being driven from their homes. They're being attacked and persecuted because of who they are, what their name is, what their religion is. I'm, at this point, heading a small UN office. There are no UN peacekeepers in this area because they were not allowed to, to enter. And we're, with three human rights lawyers, trying to save the lives of hundreds of thousands of people who are being persecuted. A futile and hopeless task at which we failed miserably. The morning that I'm going to refer to in February 1994, we arrived at the office very early, just after sunrise. And we found standing at the door of our office a young girl of 13 and her grandfather. Her grandfather turned around and when we saw his face, it was beaten to a pulp. So he didn't even look human anymore. It was just red mush. It was scary, terrible. And first concern was, we need to take this man to the hospital. We need to get treatment for him. He refused immediately. He wanted to tell his story. Beside him, his young granddaughter of 13 was standing in a bloodied skirt. We took them into our office, and they told us their story. The night before, the granddaughter, 13-year-old girl, was raped in front of her parents. Her parents were killed before her eyes, her grandfather beaten after witnessing the rape of both his granddaughter and his daughter. The only thing they wanted was to get out and flee from this situation. They were one very small family that we could assist to get out of Bosnia through a mechanism with the International Red Cross, Committee of the Red Cross, and through 
a very quick process, we got them out of Bosnia to Austria where they had proper medical care and hopefully a much better life. But every night, hundreds of cases like this were going on that we could not even see. We would drive around in the middle of the night trying to stop attacks with unarmed, just three human rights lawyers. It was insane. Why am I telling you these stories 20 years later? Why is it relevant to our discussion today? I think what I want to point out to you, and this is really the tragic part of it, 20 years on, 20 years after the genocide in Rwanda, more than 20 years after the story I told you took place in Srebrenica. And of course, you know that in 1995, the worst massacre in Europe since the Second World War would also take place in the same town. But now, we see a proliferation of conflicts around the world, an intensification of conflicts in some areas that have been going on for some time. You know the places I'm talking about. You've seen them in the news. Syria, Iraq, Yemen's on the brink, Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine, Gaza, South Sudan, Central African Republic. It's overwhelming. What can we do? What I can tell you is that we're no better now, 20 years later, at protecting children in conflict than we were 20 years ago. And you've seen some of the conflicts I refer to going on year after year without any ability to protect children in that situation. So what is the, the last resort for desperate people in conflict? Well, the only, the only course of action that becomes rational at some point is to flee. You flee for your life. So I ask then, with all of the wonderful legal frameworks we've developed over the last 20, 30, 40 years, and we're celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, why is it that we cannot protect children better? And what happens when people do flee? Do we welcome them and act in their best interests? Or do we build barriers, walls, fences, navies? Do we worry first and foremost about security or about the best interests of children who deserve protection? When there's a balance of interests, which interest takes precedence? And I would argue that we need to take the best interests of children, which is the core principle of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, more seriously. We need to give it precedence. Because the way we act now, not only do we fail to protect children in danger, but even when we, people flee, they're often pushed back. Or barriers are put up so it's very difficult for them to get out of where they are. I don't think we can be very proud of that. Now that's, that's conflict, and that's the context today of where we've come after 20 years, not too far. But what about outside of conflict? How are we doing with children's rights there? Maybe because we have a less complex situation, less politics involved, less danger in deciding whether or not to intervene to protect people, because that's always a very difficult and complex process if one needs to protect people in a conflict zone. How do you do that? What legal mechanisms allow you to do that? And that's a whole other topic of conversation. But outside of conflict, the basic rights of children to primary education, to health care, to life. And let's look at some of these statistics. Some of the statistics that prove how we're doing now. 17,000 children under five or more will die today of preventable illnesses and diseases. More than 6.3 million each year under five. Not from diseases we cannot prevent, not for the, from illnesses we cannot cure, but from diseases and illnesses we know exactly how to prevent, and it doesn't even cost as much to prevent. 17,000 children today. 150 million girls. 150 million girls. 73 million boys have been 
victims of rape or sexual assault. The numbers are staggering. It's unbelievable. 50 million children, primary school age, not able to go to primary school for various reasons, usually linked to poverty and deprivation. And I could go on, tens of millions stateless, when they have the right to nationality and identity under the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And when I try to put this into context, I think, I reach out to you and I say, it, it's overwhelming, it's mind-boggling. We need to actually sensitize ourselves because the numbers are so large, the problems seem so complex. We tend to throw in the towel and say, it's too big, it's too complex, what can I do as an individual? And I would say, you know, each and every one of you can do a lot. First and foremost, take ownership. In our own homes, commit to no violence. That's already a massive step forward. We develop our policy as an international community as if we are parents in a family and we have five, four or five children. We decide to feed and clothe four of those children, send them to the doctor when they're ill, make sure they have proper medicine, send them to the best schools we can afford. And we decide that that other child we have, because we're going to put the resources to the other four, we'll leave that child to die. We're not going to send that children, child to school. We're not going to provide medicine for that child when that child is ill. We are a global community, and those children are our collective responsibility. So this is a fairly depressing picture I'm painting. And that's not my purpose in talking with you today. I actually believe that my generation has failed, has failed to live up to the best interests of children and protect those interests. But just as I believe we failed, I really believe that you will succeed to live up to these principles. You have all the tools, you have the creativity, you have the science and the medicine to make solutions for people who before were vulnerable, easily treatable and protectable. You have the finances and the wealth. Look at what was done with the Ice Bucket Challenge, for example, recently. How much money was raised for a relatively obscure, unknown illness? Imagine what you can do in crowdfinancing an end to poverty in one particular country, or access to primary education in an entire region. With own, our own resources, forget about government resources. We have enough wealth. We can solve the problems. You can solve the problems. So I believe with that possibility, combined with the global mentality that a new generation has, if you see each other as one family, because we know we are. The cocoon, the bubble we live in, is the whole planet. We can no longer live in isolation, and we don't. So that child that we leave out is our brother and sister, our son, our daughter. And the solutions to cure these problems and to act in the best interest of children everywhere are before us and in your hands. And I'm confident you're going to use use them and realize the promise that is before you. Thank you so much.